Hi folks, I just wanted to carry on with what, what we talked about last Wednesday, which I thought was interesting. And, and I you know, really appreciate your um, response or feedback on things. So last week we were talking about the other uh, and about God, which we don't normally talk about. Um, and we had a discussion, I remember, about what the other was. Is there the other? Is there something the other to pray to when things are really tough? Or am I the other? You know, is there no separation between me and the other? Um, and it reminded me, so I, I dug out uh, some words about Pure Land Buddhism. I don't know if you're familiar with Pure Land, but Pure Land is the, um, the most popular uh, style of Buddhism in Japan, much more, much more popular than, uh, than Zen. Uh, and Pure Land was uh, <coughs> was really directed at, at, at peasant folk, unsophisticated people that weren't uh, very literal or literate or sophisticated, um, and it arose out of Shinran. I think Shimran redefined Pure Land. I can't remember the origination of Shimran of Pure Land. But interestingly, uh, D.T. Suzuki, which, who wrote a lot about Zen all his life, and toward the end of his life became a real serious devotee of Pure Land, which was you know, fascinating for everybody, given that how D.T. Suzuki was such a uh, wonderful writer and intellectual, and also really embodied the Zen tradition. And essentially, the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, people who, who, who in the Pure Land tradition, they're, 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 they, they, only, they only do one thing, basically. I mean, I'm making it very simplistic, but they chant Namu Amida Butsu. Namu Amida Butsu is the name of Amida. And they'll chant it and chant it thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. And the intention is that in the chanting of Amida, Namu Amida Butsu, that they will um, find themselves in the Pure Land. And this pure land came from, um, uh, you might call it a, 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 a real. I mean, some people really believe in Buddha Amida or uh, Amita, Amitabha. Amitabha, is that how you say it? Amitabha? Amitabha. Amitabha. It's the same word, Amida, Amitabha. They use the, the, the moving around. Chinese pronunciation, I think, is Amitofu. Ama. Amitofu. Amitofu? Yeah. Oh. Chinese pronunciation. Oh, right, okay. Not to do with tofu then. No, no the, the okay. fu um, at the end basically means Buddha. Ah, okay. So Amida is a, a kind of cosmic Buddha, or if you like a literal Buddha. And he made a vow that all beings would be uh, reborn in the Pure Land if they surrendered to. to his help or her help. So you name you keep chanting the name of Amida Butsu. Um, and I'll read it to you what this says, what this the other you know, actual So the compassion of all the Buddhas through transcending all the categories of thought, including those of subject and object, appear to our ego orientated perception as a force which acts upon us externally as the other power. This Shamran makes quite clear when he says, what is called external power is as much to say that there is no discrimination of this or that. To surrender to the other power means to transcend the distinction between subject and object. As we identify ourselves with Amida, so Amida identifies himself with us. So what Shimran, who's, who kind of revitalized Pure Land, is saying that, that there is this other power, but that when we transcend the difference between subject and object, i.e. we being the subject and this other power being the object, when we transcend that, we identify ourselves with that other power. So we then, or this other power then becomes us. So that, that's one way of, of seeing of, of, of the other. 
Um, so initially, the adherents of Pure Land are counting on the external help of the other, Amida Butsu, but in the realization of Pure Land, they then realize that they are themselves the Amida Buddha. So it starts off with, an, with another. And then I, I then led that on then to uh, the, the concept of God, which obviously is the definitive of that, that's, that's most common in our culture. And then um, this is interesting, this person says that certainly the concept of God as a person is preferable to a Buddhist shunyata or emptiness misunderstood as a static or nihilistic or to a Brahman an abstract otherworldliness that has no relation to our lives. So what the per this commentator is saying that the concept of God as a person is better, more preferable, and by that I mean better for our well-being, than the idea that shunyata or emptiness actually is nihilistic and, uh, and contains no sense of, of the sacred, if you like, or, or, or meaning. And this, the commentator goes on to say that even a non-dualist, you know, in, in a sense, uh, our, the Zen tradition is based on non-dualism, even a non-dualist might point out that the theist who sincerely tries to love all God's creatures might well make more spiritual progress towards selflessness than the meditator who greedily desires enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But the danger of these errors is clearly indicated within the non-dualistic tradition. So, I mean, it is, it, he's saying that there is this danger that, uh, that everyone is uh, spiritually materialistic then that is less good for one's own well-being and for others than the belief uh, in the love of God. Of course, you know, in this tradition we do, we do absolutely talk, well, absolutely, that's the wrong word, but we do make a, you know, an effort, an emphasis on not being stuck in the non-dual, in the absolute. That one has to manifest in the material, phenomenal, dualistic worlds in order to be any use to anyone. Um, but this is what this is what's interesting for me. Um, the above interpretation implies that before we become completely enlightened, we shall experience the operation of the absolute upon us as God. God is the absolute seen from the outside. But that is the only way the Absolute can be seen, since in itself it is so devoid of characteristics that it is literally a nothing. God is a God only in relationship to me when there is no longer a me. So he's saying that God is only the other, can only be the other when you are identified with you with the me, with the small I. When that small I dissolves, then the concept of the being another I a God dissolves as well. But this is this is this is the point I wanted to ask you about that's it's interesting for me. Ramakrishna, <coughs> Indian mystic, said that he preferred to taste sugar than to become sugar. He preferred to taste sugar than to become sugar. I don't know what your interpretation of that is. I mean, I know what it means for me, but I'm interested in what it means for you. By the way, for the folk who, 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 who are relatively new here, apologies. This is not, you know, this is a, this is not what we. This is not the noble class we have, and it may, it may not. I don't know whether it grabs you, but apologies if it's a, it seems a bit esoteric or in the head. But yeah. So, what does what what, what does that mean for you? He preferred to taste sugar than become sugar. What, what does, what's that about? If you are sugar, you wouldn't <clears throat> have any experience of tasting sugar. That's right. You wouldn't, would you? No. <laughs> so maybe he's, he's saying 
he likes the sweetness of life, the model of life, you know, he likes the experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the pleasures of life. Yeah. 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 And that yeah. can only be done. That can only be done from four. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So that leads on to what we, you know, what what we, what is what is our kind of mantra here? Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Yeah. So, and in this instance, I guess as you point out, the form is the taste of sugar, and the emptiness is the sugar. For me, it seems to be set up a duality just there. You know. Yeah, there is a duality, yeah. You know, he's, you know, he's preferring one side to the other instead of just saying, well, it's all the same. Yeah, but he's, he's, he's saying he's got a preference. Yeah. What do you think about that? Stuck. <laughs> <laughs> In one sense, he can say he's stuck. Um, the other phrase the guy used about. Um, but hang on, just, 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 just to think with, is he still stuck if he has absolute, if he has experience being sugar, but he's saying, actually, yeah, yeah, I, suppose I want to come off that now. Yeah, just do that, yeah. <laughs> I want to I have a taste of it. Yeah. yeah. Is, is he still stuck? But it's, for me, it's, it's like life's interwoven with it all, so, you know, yeah. I'm have both, but yeah. without being stuck, in, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go on to that in a bit, but yeah, good. So what do you think about this idea of uh, God is the absolute seen from the outside? That's the one I'm saying, but outside of what? Yeah. Pardon? For me, it's outside of what? It's like a phrase for me, uh, uh, I wrote it down, it meant a lot to me, it says um, that nothing falls out of the moon, you know, nothing falls out of this, uh, it's just all there, so what is, yeah. it? He's not, how can he go outside and look at it when he's in? It seems to be impossible. Well, it's, 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 well, a bit it's bit, maybe a bit philosophical, <laughs> he hasn't actually looked into the experience, you know, clarified it himself. This commentator says though, that the concept of God as a person is preferable to a Buddhist shunyata, which is misunderstood as static or nihilistic. So he hasn't, he hasn't experienced that, and that's it, because if he didn't experience that, my, my argument would be he said that that was God as well. But he's saying he was perceived, he's not saying that that's how he perceives it, he's saying that if somebody perceives it in that way, yeah. then it's understandable that they might choose. Yeah. I, the I idea that it's yeah. bigger that they can depend yeah. on. I, I mean, I think he's making a case for, for some folk that in terms of, of, uh, of, of their own well-being and their care for other people, to see yeah. God as something outside of themselves is really works for them. Yeah. You know, it's legitimate. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. It, 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 may lead, it may lead to a better place. Just wanted to throw in that you know we're not we're not the gold we're not we're not a look at the gold either. You know? <laughs> Sorry, what, Susie? I can't remember now. Oh. It was the previous question you said about seeing God from the outside. Yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, this. The phrase is the God is the absolute seen from the outside. So technically, the words like Keith said don't really add up, but is it kind of pointing towards when you're in that, when it, it feels like you're separate? Yeah. I mean, definitely I feel sometimes like a tight screw and totally separate from everything else in yeah. the universe. So does it mean from that place? From that place, because then he then goes on to say, God is the absolute seen from the outside, but that is the only way that the absolute can be seen. Because if you are at one with the absolute, obviously, as, as, as you pointed out, you can't see it. You, you know, you are the sugar. You can't taste the sugar because you're it. Mm. So, I suppose what I'm coming around to is that 
there is a virtue in the idea of the other because when we do feel as you say like a tag screw separate from everything else then there is the option to pray I think it's not something we often talk about yeah. part of the difficulty that I pick up is, is in the wording of the commentator is yeah. to whether he, he's saying actually the Buddhist, the Buddhist idea of emptiness is, is difficult you know, is by its nature difficult because it will lead you into this sense of the void, you yeah. know, the heartless, yeah. cold universe that's yeah. indifferent to uh, whether he's saying that or saying it, that is a danger. It's a danger, it's you're a saying danger. it's a danger, yeah. yeah. It is a danger Rather for than folk. It's inevitable. Well, hopefully not inevitable, otherwise we'll all all of us Stop. are in some dark, bloody cold hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Which, which seems about as sensible as, you know, the, the drop of water complaining that the ocean doesn't care for it personally. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is possible. Yeah. But it's, it's that, that small self perspective, isn't it? That the universe doesn't give a damn about me individually. Yeah. Which is the trap. The trap, yeah. Sensei, in your view, interpreting Shinata as nihilism, do you think it's the right interpretation? No. I hope not. Because Buddha and all the patriarchs emphasise the middle way, yeah. neither nihilistic nor eternalistic. That's right, yeah. So in that way, I mean, I, I can empathise with the danger that the author <coughs> pointed out, but to me, I would imagine that's not quite the right understanding. Oh, it isn't, for sure. I mean, it's, the it's, 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 it's like it's a big, you know, devil cross saying, don't go this way. Emptiness is not realistic. But let me just wrap this up because I wanted to tie it up with Dolben, which we could come right back to, to not necessarily uh, come to Dolben. But in the Song of Enlightenment, so this is, I hope this is not rambling, it's quite hard to hold the whole thing together. But in the Song of Enlightenment it says, Have you not seen a man of the Tao at his ease, in his non-active Wu way, and beyond learning states, who neither suppresses thoughts nor seeks the real? To him, the real nature of ignorance is Buddha Dharma, and the non-existent body of illusion is Dharmakaya. To reject delusion, sorry, I'm, this is now, this is out of that. So to reject delusion and accept truth is just another form of delusion. To reject delusion and accept truth is just another form of delusion. So to, to, to accept it's only sugar and not the taste of sugar is another delusion. So, so he goes on to say that, for such discrimination between rejecting and accepting is still dualistic. One who practices in this way mistakes the thief for his own son. The way is not a matter of escaping delusion, because there is nowhere to escape to, which you said, except to an equally delusive quietism. It is rather a matter of liberating delusion. So this is where we come to Dogen, Dogen because Dogen says, to liberate your delusion. How would you liberate your delusion? Do you give in? Yeah. <laughs> what do you know? No, give in. <laughs> Liberating delusion is being both the sugar and tasting it, depending on what is appropriate at the time. You know. So this is what this is what this person says. What distinguishes liberated delusion? What distinguishes it? What marks it? It's the utter freedom of the mind to dance freely from one empty thing to another, from one set of concepts to a different and perhaps contradictory set. The difference is not necessarily in the concepts themselves, they may be the same, but how effortlessly the mind is able to play with them without getting stuck. To the extent that the mind thinks there is an obje objectifiable truth, or to the extent that it thinks dwelling in blackness of mind is the truth, this freedom is not realized. So it's saying if you're stuck in the idea of emptiness, it's, it's not realization, and if you're stuck in the idea that, that there is only the phenomenal world, that's not it either. So liberating the illusion is being able 
to be deluded when it's appropriate, i.e. when you want to talk to the, you know, get a ticket on the bus and you know where you want to go, you don't want to go like, oh, I'll go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now the other thing is, you know, maybe you just want to hang out and relax and you don't mind what happens and it's fine, you know, you're okay with that. Or, uh, you know, the other perspective is that, you know, you, you, you completely acknowledge interdependence and you act according to that interdependence rather than a separate human being that's that's being the sugar it's, it's, it, for me it's like you know you, you're the relative manifesting of the absolute you're also the absolute manifesting of the relative yeah and to look at to look at it in a separate way is like putting a third person there you know yeah. that's separate from that whole bloody yeah. thing you know yes. so you might think that wine is great all wine is great, but when you go to Tesco or whatever to buy it, you have a choice, you know, you want a particular type. It's okay. That's not, that's when, you know, we talk about preference. We have to exercise preference. But as long as we exercise it without wobbling, it's okay. So, so all I'm trying to, all I've been trying to say all evening is, the idea of another on whom you can call for help is a completely valid place to be. It's not denied. Which I think is, you know, it's comforting. Yeah. Because sometimes we just can't manage. And anyway, even, <laughs> even if you're doing that, it's still part of the whole thing. It's still part of the whole thing, yeah, there's, no, as, as, there's nowhere else to go. It's still part, exactly, it's still part of the whole thing. So we know, we know, you know, we talk about Zen as being the, 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 the religion before religions. You know, it's like the basis, the ground on which religions, other religions, not Zen, but in the, what we're talking about, emptiness and form, form, it's out, out of which the specific, other different religions arise. That doesn't need, mean that we need to be sniffy about them. It's a legitimate uh, way to, you know, way, way to, to lead your life. <coughs> It would be nice if some of them thought it was legitimate for us to lead our lives with Buddhists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, can I do, just sound the thing of chanting that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Namu Amida Butsu. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, e practice. it's easy to think uh, in a rather, you know, disdainful, sniffy way, well, how ridiculous, you know, just chanting a name. That's gonna... But of course, that's a valid faith for lots of people. And it would have to concede that we chant a lot. Don't we? And yeah. every week we, we chant mm. stuff that isn't always perfectly clear to us, if, if ever. Um, but I think, I think the heart surgery is so helpful with all of this, you, you know, about saying no, 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 yeah. not even that. Yeah. And no Buddha, no path, no wisdom, forget no it. Gain, you know. No gain, no love. <laughs> and not the opposite of it either. And not the opposite, yeah. You know, yeah. it puts you in, a, in a, a dilemma which hopefully takes us beyond that. that. Yeah. Distinction. Yeah, that's well said. So, yeah. chanting is, yeah, is okay. You know, and the, and the other thing about Namo Inabutsu is it is a mantra, you know, mantras are really powerful, it's all that they use in, uh, in, in TN. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you if you totally identified and focused on the mantra, then there isn't any space for other thoughts to arise, so you do become one pointed. And, and, and in, that, in that one pointedness, you can then experience what it's like for the self to, 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 to be to diminish and even to bugger off. <laughs> so uh, so it is a very valid practice. Is there a pure one group round here? Yeah, yeah we should, maybe we should sort of branch <laughs> a splinter group. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, and, and Martin, thank you for the last week for what you said, it, it prompted me into looking into this, so thank you. Mm.